Friends, if you're able, I invite you to turn with me in God's word. We're going to be in the book of Zechariah. We're going to read chapter 5 today, verses 1 through 11. That's the whole chapter of Zechariah 5, and those verses are found in the Pew Bible I have on page 879. If you want to listen to those who are listening on live stream or on YouTube, on KHK radio or local television, wherever you are, whenever you are, if you're hearing these words, I invite you to turn with us to Zechariah chapter 5 this morning. Today we're going to be looking at vision number 6 and 7. Um, these are, just to warn you, very disturbing images. Uh, this coming week, I'm going to be in denominational meetings, which is disturbing in its own way. And then we're going to come back the following Sunday. So next Sunday, Reverend Tinklenberg will lead us. Um, and we're going to step away from Zechariah, and he'll be in the Sermon on the Mount with you. And then when I come back, we're going to go to, to Vision 8, and then we're going to continue on with the book when those visions conclude. As we've been going through this book, in many ways, these opening visions have been for these exiles who have come back from 70 years of captivity to a ruined country, they've been words of God encouraging them, encouraging, uplifting visions. The two visions today are, again, I said disturbing, or visions that challenge. And whether those visions are for us encouraging or challenging in all of the visions, in all of this book, what God is doing is he is using Zechariah to draw our eyes to Jesus. Again, we saw that this book, maybe more than almost any other one, uniquely reveals who Jesus is, and Jesus' death for us. And so even in these disturbing visions, our prayer is that we'll get a glimpse of our Savior. And with that, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, in a world where so often we pretend to be better than we are, when we hide behind masks, when we put on a good face, we thank you that you invite us as a community of faith to come each week and to confess our sin, to be honest before you, to be honest before each other, because in this honesty of repentance is our rest and our salvation, as we find that indeed you have borne our sins on your Son, our Savior. So we pray that once again you'd help us to look deeply at the sin in our world and in our own souls, but more than that, Lord, that we would see what Christ has done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Zechariah chapter five. Zechariah says, I looked again, and there before me was a flying scroll. The angel asked me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll, 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. And he said to me, this is the curse that is going out over the whole land, for according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. It will remain in his house and destroy it, both its timbers and its stones. Then the angel who was speaking to me came forward and said to me, look up and see what is this that is appearing. And I asked, what is it? He replied, it is a measuring basket. And he added, this is the iniquity of the people throughout the land. Then the cover of lead was raised, and there in the basket sat a woman. He said, this is wickedness, and he pushed her back into the basket, and he pushed the lead cover down over its mouth. Then I looked up, and there before me were two women with the wind in their wings. They had wings like those of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. Where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel who was speaking to me. He replied to the country of Babylonia to build a house for it. When it is ready, the basket will be set there in its place. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, every one of us sleeps. In fact, some of you might be doing that before the end of the sermon. Every one of us sleeps. And every one of us dreams. This is a a common human experience. And in fact, it's so common that researchers have been able to map around the world and to see that these dreams that we do, in fact, every human being in the course of an average human life will will spend six years dreaming. That's 2,100 days in an altered state of consciousness, in an alternate reality. And often those realities are populated in our nightmares by monsters. So researchers have been able to look around the world and they see that even though this is a common experience, there are different kinds of monsters, different kinds of dreams depending on the country where you live in. So for example, if you grew up in Brazil, the most common monster in the night is snakes, which makes sense. Brazil is in, the, of course, the Amazon basin. Actually, 52 countries, the most common dream animal is a snake. 
If you go um, in North America, in the U.S. or Canada, our top nightmare is teeth falling out. Because we eat a lot of sugar and drink Mountain Dew. I don't know. If you go to Argentina, the top monster in our dream are spiders. If you go to Mexico, the top thing is your ex. Apparently, that's what they dream about in Mexico. You can actually research the brokenness out by country. So in the U.S., you can see our, our top nightmare is, again, um, teeth falling out. Then next comes snakes, X, spiders, vacation, being chased, wedding, flies, sex, and a bear. Apparently, that's us. And if you go to Canada, just a little bit north, you're Canadian, a little bit different. Teeth falling out, still there, car, snake, someone dying, crying, flies, pregnancy, tornado, cats, the dead and being chased. I like that it's tornado, the dead being chased by the dead, and cats right there. <laughs> in these dream worlds we spend six years of our life in, they are often disturbing images. Images that cause us to wonder what they could mean. Those nightmares haunt us because they give us these images that sink into our soul. So you think about that, we have tonight again these visions in the night that God gives this young priest named Zachariah, and the two that we have this morning are those kinds of disturbing images. A curse flying like a scroll, a wicked woman in a basket clawing to get out. These are disturbing. And yet I want to suggest as we look at this pair of nightmares, we catch a glimpse of something. We catch a glimpse of God's grace beginning to dawn. How do we see that? Let's look a little bit deeper. So jump into the text, chapter five, verse one, we get a sense of again where we are. Chapter five, verse one says this. I looked again and there before me was a flying scroll. So he's in this time, it goes back to chapter one, this is that same time period. The word of the Lord comes to Zechariah, uh, the son of Edah, the son of Berechiah, during the night I had a vision. So this is a vision in the night, but this is not just any vision, it's not just in any dream. This is the word of the Lord. This is a divine dream given to Jeremiah. What does he see? Well, the angel kind of explains what he's seeing. What he sees is a flying scroll and it is 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. This is 40 times larger than any scroll we have ever found in history. So he looks up and he sees a scroll, a very common thing that's just like the books we have today, but this is less a book and more of a billboard. This is a scroll made out of animal hide and it is tearing out through the sky, huge, 30 foot long, 15 feet wide. A remarkable sight for this young priest to see. And what's even more remarkable is not the size of it, which is clearly to show that it can be seen by all and it can be read by all. But what's remarkable is what you read when you look at it. Because the angel goes on. He said to me, this is the curse that is going out over the whole land. This gigantic scroll searing its way through the sky that everyone can see and everyone can read are words of a curse. The scroll, of course, is bringing us back to Deuteronomy chapter 11, that covenant document, where we read, see, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord, your God, that I'm giving you today, and a curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord, your God. God's people, in fact, the whole world is in rebellion against God's command, so God's curse comes swooping down out of heaven, suspended between heaven and earth, crossing the land for everyone to see and everyone to read the curse that is coming. And then we're given the reason for that curse, specifically. This is the curse that is going out over the whole land, for according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished, and according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. Now, some scholars say these are, these are two commandments, right? The thief, that's the eighth commandment, thou shall not steal. Swearing falsely, and then we're told in the name of the Lord later in this text, is the third commandment, don't take the Lord's name in vain. So some say what's going on in the land is that we have the breaking of these two specific commandments. People are stealing from each other and they're lying about it. But more likely, these aren't the only two sins, these are representative that eighth commandment represents the second table of the law, the way we're called to love our neighbor. The third commandment represents the first table of law, how we are called to love God. One scholar says this, the two crimes Zechariah mentioned represent all of the commandments. In each of the two tables of the 10 commandments, the angel pronounces judgment on the people because they had broken every commandment about faithfulness to the Lord, as well as every commandment about relationships with their neighbor. They are not loving the Lord, their God with all their heart, they are not loving their neighbor as their self. 
In fact, James chapter 2, verse 10 would say, if you break one commandment, you have broken all of them. So Zechariah looks up and he sees this massive curse, seen by all, read by all. It is the curse of the covenant. It's because they have disobeyed God's commandments. And then he's told what the effect of the curse will be. These words. For the Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. It will remain in his house and destroy it, both its timbers and its stone. The curse will find us out even for hiding in our homes. It will enter in and it will destroy everything around us, even the stone. With this image, this disturbing image is showing is the truth of Numbers chapter 32. You may be sure that your sin will find you out. Or Ecclesiastes 12, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Or as one scholar says, the flying scroll of the law shows that sin will be discovered and everyone will see and everyone will read. That's the first image. Then comes the second image, which in some ways is even more disturbing. Notice so again, it's this dialogue. And so the angel who was speaking to me came forward and said, look up. So he saw the curse in there. Now he looks up and he sees a new thing and see what is, is appearing and asked, what is it? And he replied, it's a measuring basket. So he sees this bushel basket, like a barrel. This is a harvest of some kind, but notice what it's a harvest of. A measuring basket, he added, this is the iniquity of the people. He sees a bushel basket of wickedness. He sees a harvest of human sin. And then this this harvest has something inside of it. There's a lead lid holding something inside that's trying to get out. And the lid is lifted. And notice what we see. We see a woman. And the angel says this woman is the personification of wickedness itself. Think of a witch coming out of a cauldron. And she is trying to claw her way out. Notice the action of the angel. Then the lead cover was raised, there's this woman, and the angel pushed her back into the basket, and he pushed the lid cover over. This woman, wickedness itself, is trying to claw its way back out into the land in this basket of of iniquity. And the angel has to slam this lead lid back on, and then two other beings, women with wings like storks, come and they lift the basket up into the air between heaven and earth, and they take it away to Babylon. These are disturbing images, a scroll that's massive with the words of God's curse, a basket of wickedness with a woman, a weevil woman trying to crawl out. These are disturbing images. But what's maybe even more disturbing is what they point to because they point to the reality of our sin, of people's sin. One scholar says this, after a series of visions proclaiming promise to the Persian period community, This passage delivers a warning. It reminds those within the covenant community that they cannot ignore or abuse God's covenant law and expect to escape discipline. He continues to take sin seriously. Another scholar says, the sixth vision teaches that the Lord who loves and restores his people is also righteous and will punish wickedness. This vision and the one to follow are warnings. What these visions of the night, this nightmare shows is that God sees and God judges sin. God sees and God judges sin. That's a disturbing set of images, isn't it? Because that's a disturbing truth. Now at some level, we can see these images and wrestle with them, and as I read commentaries, there are a number of things we're kind of generally disturbed about before we even get to the truth. For some of us, we're maybe disturbed because we live in a, a very sensitive time of microaggressions and trigger warnings. And so the idea of a curse that massive, that public, that just kind of puts us off. We don't really think about curses, let alone something like that. Maybe some of us are feminists, and so we, we tr- tripped over the fact that wickedness is personified as a woman. And actually, many commentators were trying to explain this, saying, well, wickedness is a feminine word in Hebrew. Or maybe, well, often wickedness is presented as a prostitute or whatever, but we're maybe offended by that. Or maybe as scientific people, the whole idea that there'd be things like curses and baskets that fly and women with wings like storks, that just seems too fantastical. This seems much too dreamlike for modern people. But I think below the images, what is disturbing is that truth that God sees and that God judges sin. Recently, I was reading in CNN an article on a documentary on Little Richie. 
So this is good golly, Miss Molly, right? Twist and shout, that, that early rock and roller. This article on Little Richie um, was entitled, Little Richie Filmmaker Found a Lesson in the Late Singer's Spirited, Spirited Rock and Roll Life. And the director of that documentary, reflecting on all that she had discovered about this man, had an insight about not just him, but about God and about humanity. An insight, I think, shared by many of CNN's readers because it's shared by most Americans. She said this, I think it is so important for people not to negate who they are and to remember if they believe in a God, that it's a God who loves us for being our authentic selves, she said. He is all loving and all encompassing. I think this is all what I take from Richard's journey. Life is not lived in opposition. It is lived in the unity of everything that makes you beautifully human. I think she speaks in a very beautiful way the spirit of our age, which tells something about what we think about God and something what we think about ourselves. What we think about God is that God is all loving. He is all encompassing. This is not a God who would send a curse. This is not a God who will give a law and say obey it. This is not a God who will name things as wickedness and push it in a basket. This is the God who is all loving, who does not judge, who embraces all things. That's what's true about God and what's true about us is we are all lovable. We just embrace our authentic selves. We just do us because who we are is good. We are wonderful beings and God just loves us and there's no judgment and there's no curse and there is no fear. There is no God who sees sin because there is no sin and there is no judgment. This view of God and view of us in some ways reflects even someone like Anne Frank, if you ever read the diary of Anne Frank, who even in the midst of Nazi occupation said, I still believe in spite of everything that people are truly good at heart. This is the way we see ourselves, isn't it? Which is why it's so disturbing when we see an image of something other than that. When behind the humanism of our moment we discover that maybe human hearts aren't so pure. This week I was reading a blog post by one of my seminary professors, and he began talking about a man I hadn't really heard of before, heard very, um, his name is Dennis Rader. Dennis uh, lived in Kansas near Wichita, and he was kind of the all-American sort of guy. He was a a devoted father of two children, a a loving husband. Uh, Dennis Rader uh, was a Boy Scout troop leader. He worked for many years with ADT security installing home security systems, so kind of the kind of person who would come into your house to make sure your house was safe. In addition to that, Dennis Rader was an office bearer in his church and he was even president of council in his local Lutheran congregation. Look at Dennis Rader and he was a wonderful person. Except that several years ago he was arrested after a 30 year manhunt and he was identified and confessed to being the BDK killer, the, 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 the bind, uh, torture, BTK, bind, torture, kill, serial killer. That all through this time that he was installing security systems and going to church, bringing his family, raising them to love God, serving as president of council, serving as a Boy Scout troop leader, during all that time, he was going around and killing human beings, including children. Just even reading the Wikipedia article, I felt unholy. A monster or not. He did monstrous things and yet he lived his life and even his children, when they told him about it, were shocked because he did monstrous things but he wasn't a monster. Images like that are disturbing to us because they make us question, who are we? And it's not just people like like Dennis Rader. In that same blog post, uh, my professor talked about a news article that made international news this summer about a CRC pastor. Maybe some of you saw this. A former pastor charged with killing an eight-year-old girl who was walking to Bible camp nearly 50 years ago. This pastor was pastor of Blue Mall Trinity CRC in Blue Mall, Pennsylvania. That's the church Jill Koch, my colleague in town, pastored after him. This Trinity CRC had a joint Bible school with a Presbyterian church nearby. That pastor's daughter was eight years old, was walking between the churches when this CRC pastor stopped her and killed her. And he went on to pastor that church and he pastored another church and he pastored another CRC church and he retired and he's 80 years old. This wonderful man that people described as a good and loving pastor, not a monster, and yet something monstrous within. God sees and judges sin because he sees us and he knows us. 
Maybe the truth that we have in our world today about who God is and who we are is not an accurate one. And maybe when we see the accurate one, it is disturbing, but maybe it's the real one. Elizabeth Ochtemeyer says this, We modern students of the prophet sometimes recoil before such a portrayal of God because we have so sentimentalized the deity, remember he's just a loving father, that we do not believe he would curse anyone or any lifestyle, but the prophets know better. God demands obedience to his commandments and he will settle for nothing less, and that is what is disturbing. James says if you break one commandment, you've broken all of them. Jesus deepens those commandments. If you even hate your brother, you have murdered. When we see that, we recognize that all of us, in the words of one theologian, are a basket of deplorables. All of us have that monstrous wickedness living within us. And we look up with Zechariah and we see the curse, massive flying between heaven and earth, foreseen by all, read by all, and we read the words of the curse and the disobedient and we recognize that we too deserve the curse because God sees the sin in us as well. So after these visions of encouragement, he sees these disturbing visions with a disturbing truth. And yet behind the vision, I think there are some clues of hope. The first is the language of curse is actually bringing us back to a broader set of words, the language of covenant. There's an interesting detail here about that massive scroll. Did you notice it? It's written on one side, and then it says on the other side. <clears throat> now, a scroll with the writing on two sides is often in the Old Testament a description of a covenant document. So, for example, in Exodus, when Moses comes down from the mountain with two tablets of the testimony in his hands, they're inscribed on both sides, on front and on back. That is the covenant document, the commandments by which Israel is to live in God's covenant. The language of cursing is reminding us that we have a God who enters into relationship, who makes promises. In those 10 commandments, these words, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Punishment is there, but also showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. This image of the scroll is a reminder to Israel that they serve a God who has bound himself to them with promises, has made a covenant. And there are consequences of curses, but there's also a promise of blessing. But there's another clue to this. Do you notice this basket that's lifted between heaven and earth is then brought somewhere? Where is it brought? Well, we're told this. Where are they taking the basket, asked the angel. The angel said he is taking it to the country of Babylonia. Now, the Hebrew there doesn't say Babylonia. It says Shinar which brings us back to an older story in Genesis chapter 11, at the beginning of history. As men moved eastward, they found the plain in Shinar and they settled there and they said, come, let us build up for ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. It's brought to that land of the original human rebellion where we're between heaven and earth, tried to build a name for ourselves, building a monstrosity of human pride. This basket is taken to that place of that primordial conflict but it also takes us to the end of history. Because in the end of history, we see something again. Revelation 17, come I will show you, says an angel to John. The punishment of the great prostitute, then the angel carried me away to the spirit into a desert, and there I saw a woman. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things, the filth of her idolatries. And the title was written on her forehead, the mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth, this woman, Wickedness itself, all the way from the beginning of history to the very end, will be judged by God. This vision is a glimpse into God's cosmic battle with sin and evil, a battle that we read in Revelation, he wins through the blood of the Lamb. One scholar says this, before God can bring his kingdom upon the earth, evil must be done away with. That is the principal message of this vision, There can be no compromise of God's final rule, no live and let live acceptance of the status quo. The evil ways of our society must be purged and destroyed by God before he can bring in his new order. God had brought his people out of Babylon. They returned. He needs to take Babylon out of his people. 
He needs to take those monstrous things that live in us who are not monsters, and he needs to move, remove the monstrosity, take away the wickedness. We do not want to live in a world where pastors kill eight-year-old children, where presidents of council haunt in the night. And God doesn't either. And before the new kingdom and creation can come, the old wickedness must be taken away. But there's an even greater glimpse of glory in this nightmare. Do you notice something about this description of when the basket is taken away? We read this. Then I looked up and there before me were two women with the wind at their wings. The word in Hebrew for wind is the word ruach, which is also translated spirit, the word for the Holy Spirit. Either way, scholars say these women, these angelic messengers with those wings like stork are being pushed to halt long as they do their mission by the wind of God or maybe by the very spirit of God. God is the one propelling them to take this wickedness from the land of Israel and to banish it away. God is the one doing the work. One scholar says this, God alone removes evil from his people's lives for all times according to this vision. It is an act of pure grace. He takes it away. There in the shadowy land of Shinar, it can work its destroying ways, but God's people will be delivered from it. Finally, only God is able to deliver us from evils. We pray in the Lord's Prayer. Another scholar says, the wickedness of the people is going to be removed from the land once for all. There are two descriptions in the scripture of what God does was sent, two major descriptions. One of them we see in baptism, God cleanses us from sin. He washes us clean. That is one set of images, and that we see in Jesus, right? His blood is shed to cleanse us, to clean us. That's what we saw in the vision of the priest. But there's another thing God does with sin. He removes it. He takes it away. People talk about, scholars talk about the physical removal of sin, So we see in Leviticus 16 this image. There are, in the Day of Atonement, two goats. One of the goats is, its throat is slit and the blood is poured out in the temple to cleanse. That's that first thing, but there's a second goat. The second goat is called the scapegoat, and we read this. The priest is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head, and then he shall send the goat away into the desert. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place. God not just washes, but he takes away our sin. We see the same thing in Psalm 103. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Micah chapter 7. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot. You will hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. So when Zechariah sees these nightmares, he sees something else. What would it be like to look up having seen that curse, visible to all, read by all, the curse that you deserve, and then to look up and to see this basket being taken away? What would it be look like to look up and to see our iniquities being borne away? What would it be look like to look up between heaven and earth and to see someone carrying our sin? What would it look like to look up and to see our wickedness and iniquity and sin being removed as far as the east is from the west? What would it be like to look up and to see that? What he sees is pointing to God who will send his son, who dies outside the city gates as the scapegoat, who takes on that flying curse. Galatians chapter three, we heard already, that goes on to say, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. What is it like to look up and to see that God has removed that monstrosity from within us? And he will remove every monster from his creation to make all things new. In the middle of our nightmare, a glimpse of God's dawning grace How does that look? I mentioned that serial killer. Everyone was shocked, no one saw it. He was a decent, kind person. And after he was arrested, the FBI went to his daughter, they knocked on the door and they said, have you ever heard of this killer? And she said, well, just a little bit. They said, that's your father. And when she heard that, her name is Carrie, 
her whole world was turned upside down. Everything she had lived was a lie. And she was filled with fear, with guilt, with shame, with bitterness towards her dad. She's now written a book about this process and about faith. And she talks about it, she says this. A thought, as she was struggling with unforgiveness, the thought rushed of light poured over me as I was sobbing. Like I knew, I knew that hardness had been released and I had forgiven my dad. This was after many years of trying. You know, I was forgiving him for what he had done to me, the betrayal and the lies and what he put my family through. She sat down and she wrote a letter of forgiveness to her dad. She hadn't spoken to, this was five years after the trial, after his confession. And then she says this. After I forgave my dad, I would get mad again and God, he would point me to that verse as far as the east is from the west. It was all just stuck in me until God shifted it. The evil that lived in her dad, the evil that lived in her, she could not remove. But God lifted her eyes to see the Savior who removes the monsters and the monstrosity as far as the east is from the west, from her heart, from this world. She looked up and she saw the Jesus who bears our sin. That is Zechariah's vision in the night. That is God's vision for us today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we look up and we see the way that our sin is destroying our families. We see sin destroying this world. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. Heavenly Father, we confess that this world is stalked by monsters. As we look in the mirror, we see in each of us the seeds of this wickedness. Heavenly Father, forgive us our sin. Thank you that you not only cleanse us, but that as far as the east is from the west, you have removed our sin from us. Father, as we look up and we see our Savior on that cross, may you remind us of what you have accomplished for us. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Amen.